All right, thanks guys. So supercomputing to serving, excited to chat with you. Uh, this will be a higher level talk, so no offense if you're looking for like a deep demo, uh, now is the time to exit. But I am gonna talk to you about a lot of the challenges that we've hit uh, at Cohere as we've been kind of running all the way from the beginning of how you build a foundational model all the way to the end, uh, how you serve it to customers. Um, and I'm excited to, to share the, the challenges we've hit there. So my name, Otto Mulder. I'm the Director of Infrastructure and Security. We're at a, a company called Cohere. And just a little bit of background for you about what Cohere does, uh, so you have context for why we've hit these challenges. Uh, first of all, Cohere, we were born in the cloud, so we do not have on-prem infrastructure. So everything we do is uh, based from that. Um, we don't only do multi-cloud with our SaaS systems. We actually work very tightly with our customers to do secure enterprise deployments. Uh, so this is to make sure that if customers want to uh, run within their own infrastructure, within their own security perimeter, we're able to meet them where they are. Um, we work with a lot of customers around the globe because one of our specialties is doing uh, multilingual AI and focusing really well on that. So we end up working with people who have a lot of data locality concerns um, and need to serve around the globe. So that's an, that's an area that we focus on. And then there's just a lot of unique setups that we work with. So we get exposure to a lot of different ways that people are using accelerators, using GPUs, and uh, have their own infrastructure set up. I'm gonna focus on the challenges that we've had with our own infrastructure, but just fundamentally, because of how our business, business is geared, uh, we, we have a lot of opportunities to see, see what people are doing, and it's, it's very cool. So let's peek back in time for a minute. Uh, September 2022, this was when I'd first joined Cohere, and it's before generative AI became kind of a household name. And uh, this is what roughly, at a very high level view, our, our infrastructure looked like. We had on one half our uh, internal systems that were leveraging TPUs, uh, Google, and there's a big wall in between there, uh, between training and serving. So our serving infrastructure, there was a kind of a, a little bit of a throw it over the wall mindset that those of you who have been in industry for a while may be familiar with, uh, that happens in AI as well. Um, so things would kind of get thrown over the wall after the research teams were done, they were working on the TPUs, throw it over, and then we'd optimize it for serving on GPUs. And this worked pretty well for the early days uh, when the company was smaller, um, when there weren't as many demands and things moving quickly. Uh, it allowed each group to move independently and to have a lot of control uh, over how they wanted to, to manage their infrastructure. But uh, fast forward two years, <laughs> Uh, things have changed, our company's much bigger, needs are very different, um, so consequently, we've evolved to something that looks a little bit more like this. Now, this is not a snapshot of our architecture, it's just a, a high-level overview, it's kind of the major changes we've introduced. So the key, key things that we've introduced, we're able to rapidly spin up new clusters in pretty much whatever cloud you've heard of, uh, maybe some you have not. Um, we can route workloads based on available capacity and workload demands. And the wall we had between training and infer uh, inference is, is really no more. Uh, we're able to flex capacity between our customer serving needs and our training needs, which has been really critical for the business. So one point I'd like to make, the community here should be incredibly proud of the fact that we were able to do this. I have been in the workforce for 20 years. I worked mostly with on-prem infrastructure teams before coming to, to this, uh, this group. And the fact that we could do it with a small team across multiple clouds with uh, kind of the, some of the challenges we'll talk about with the way accelerators work uh, across, across different infrastructure providers. This is cool, this is cloud native to me. Um, and I'm really excited about the, the fact that we've been able to do it. So let's talk about how, how we went uh, from here to here, because it wasn't without its challenges and that's what we'll focus on today. Um, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, and these are five challenges that have definitely made us stronger. Uh, and we'll walk through each of those in uh, progressively. All right. So first, capacity constraints. This is gonna be a 
understandable to most of you if you've been in the AI space. Um, we started out where most of our needs in the serving side was some amount of internal traffic where we need to do evals for our, our internal training teams. That would come onto our platform, maybe a, an internal version of our platform. And then we also had external facing customer traffic. This was working fine. Uh, we'd scale up as we needed to. It is literally what the cloud is designed for. You know, right here we have um, the definition of cloud computing coming from CNCF. So this is an efficient way for organizations to access necessary infrastructure flexibly and economically without excess commitment. So worked great for us uh, until we hit 2023 and everybody wanted GPUs and they were nowhere to be found. Um, also, people were asking for more and more. There was more interest in, uh, in general providers like ourselves. So when you get into a situation where you're asking for 1,001 GPUs in a data center, but they physically only have 1,000, uh, you, you start to hit these limits. And we were hitting those limits more frequently than you would expect to um, with you know, com complementary or similar CPU-based workloads. Uh, it's, it's a common problem in SaaS, right? You, everybody kind of gets to that point where you scale beyond what you can do uh, within a single region. But uh, this was exacerbated by the sheer volume of companies that had not previously needed to access GPUs that all of a sudden were grabbing them everywhere. Uh, new customers coming to us asking for us to serve more and more and more. You know, we didn't have good projections for what we needed to do. And uh, just the models themselves, many of them are compute hungry, as you are well aware. So what did we need to do? Uh, we, we came up with kind of three focuses that we needed to meet. We needed to be able to access GPUs wherever the business needed them. We needed to minimize the data replication challenges that we had. We're running a SaaS system, remember? We didn't want to deal with having to shard the database if we, we didn't actually need that. Uh, and we wanted to find the cheapest capacity because, you know, grow, 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 more, more, more. And so if you can do more uh, with the same, same number of GPUs, awesome. Um, so this is where we were able to come up with a, a pretty innovative solution. We, we enjoyed it, and it's worked well for us. Uh, we use a combination of a tool called Admiralty, then Linkerd, and then uh, Spiffy Inspire uh, to allow us to burst across multiple clouds. Again, I'm not going to go deep here, um, but I want to give you a sense of the, the tooling that we've used to enable us to do this. The, the core concept at a high level is just we're able to use Admiralty uh, to go to a central cluster, and then we create a proxy pod that connects to target clusters, and then those delegate pods are where the actual GPU resource is, and we're able to communicate back and forth. This worked for our stateless workloads. It does not work for every model or everything we need to do. Sometimes you need to be co-located with uh, the rest of your services, but it turns out it worked great for the majority of the models that we needed to serve um, and was able to address a lot of our capacity concerns. Uh, huge shout out to, to Marwin on my team who, who drove most of this. Uh, and I hope at some point he's able to give a talk going deep on this particular topic because it's pretty cool. All right, so this was, this was our first challenge. This actually worked incredibly well. Simultaneously while we were doing this and standing up, like how can we grab capacity from different clusters, different clouds, um, we were also working on our first GPU training cluster which is because, as we said previously, we were working just with TPUs, but now we decided to introduce GPUs as, as an additional accelerator to our uh, training environments. So that was happening while we were working on uh, going multi-cloud. And of course, that's where we ran smack dab into one of the most common challenges with uh, high performance computing, the high failure rates of uh, GPUs. Again, I'm not gonna go too deep here. I think most of you are well aware of these issues, but if, if you aren't, this is a, a great study that Meta put out a few months ago on the relative failure rates of CPUs versus GPUs. Yes, I think these, uh, these probably match our experience in terms of percentage of failures. Uh, really great quote from them, the complexity and potential failure scenarios of a 16K GPU training cluster surpasses the much larger CPU clusters we've operated. So you're just dealing with problems at a different scale. Um, 
so many, so many challenges. Again, not going to go deep. Uh, what I would suggest is there's a, a talk tomorrow, Resilience on AI Training, tomorrow at uh, 520, room 155E. So head over there if you're interested in some of the deep challenges that you get with, uh, with GPU training cluster failures. Um, what I will highlight, not the specific challenges, but uh, one of the challenges we had by being multi-cloud is the, the difference in cloud providers between the detections that they provide is vast. And this is, I think, something that'll converge over time, but uh, a point I'd like to call out for the community. We need to be a little more consistent around what does a cloud provider do uh, for detections and failures, and what is the responsibility of someone who's consuming or using those GPUs. Um, again, this is mostly something you see with uh, with the, the pre-training workloads, the really large workloads, because uh, with smaller workloads or inference workloads, they, they aren't as noticeable, or you look at them like more of an ephemeral uh, error, and you're able to just move past. But I think with, uh, with more and more companies getting interested in larger and larger scale training, um, solving this challenge and being a little more precise about what does the provider detect, what do you protect, is, is a, a really good thing. Um, some of the challenges with doing that is like sometimes you need the GPU to actually test the failure. So you don't know that it's gonna fail until you're running a live workload. So what do you do if you're the provider and you're, you want to make sure the GPU is available for the, the user? Um, so I can definitely see the challenge of having this shared responsibility model. Uh, there's other, other components like support and maintenance automation that's a heavy burden on infrastructure teams because the way that you automate hey, this, I need to report that this node failed or this was the particular failure that we hit. Um, if that's different from every cloud provider, it makes it very hard to have a consistent you know, cloud native interface and it's just, just really burdensome on you. Um, one thing I will say, this is a little bit of a matter of controlling your own destiny. Uh, one of the things we noticed is as we started to introduce uh, more and more detections on our side, we use things like um, I will call out node, uh, node problem detection and like, being able to use Kubernetes consistently uh, has been great for us, but as we did more of that, we noticed here's things that work better in the application stack, in the training framework, and here's things that work better outside uh, of the training framework. And it was great to develop that, you know, even more rigor beyond what we already had um, and to kind of take control of our, our destiny a little bit. Um, it made us think a lot more about building resilient applications uh, and the kinds of monitoring and visibility that you need, um, no matter where you're running. And so feeding right into that leads us to our third problem, uh, which is tightly coupled software. So we're building these resilient applications in part because they are so tightly coupled to what's happening uh, under the covers with, with the hardware. Um, I don't have a really good answer for this one. I'm just gonna highlight some of the problems that we've hit. Uh, but I do wanna highlight one of the core concepts of cloud native is be, being able to build these loosely coupled systems. And in my experience, very little is loosely coupled in the, the realm of AI and the realm of machine learning. Um, it's all just kind of one big, big blob. There's this really fantastic paper from 10 years ago that came out of the Google team. If you haven't read it, Please do. Uh, I ask everyone to, to read it. But this shows kind of the, the hidden technical debt, uh, this mass of infrastructure, surrounding infrastructure, that goes into making sure this one little bit of machine learning code works really, really well. Um, and uh, what we found is a lot of MLEs, especially as they scale up, pretty much care about the little black box, not so much around the surrounding, the surrounding bit. Um, so this is going to be a bullet list of places we've seen things be, be tightly coupled. Uh, first, obviously, the specialized network. You're tightly coupled. You can only run your pre-training job on a, a cluster with a, a fast enough network to, to support those jobs. Um, Post-training, often there's, there's a lot of jobs that can stay within a single node, and so they don't get quite as tightly coupled, but pre-training, you gotta, you gotta have that specialized network. Uh, storage libraries, especially when you're talking about going cross-cloud, there's not a lot of um, good standards, so unless you're using uh, like a distributed file system, so you kind of use the, the NFS uh, standards, if you're using object storage, it's hard when you go cross-cloud, and we've actually hit quite a few, quite a few challenges related to that um, and the object storage protocols. Uh, the training framework itself, um, 
Many of you, I'm sure, have your own stories of chasing NANDs and failures just to find out that if you upgraded one portion of your training stack, that actually solved all the problems. Uh, and it's very hard to get your teams together to, to agree on like what should we upgrade, what should we try next, um, which is a lot of tight, tightly coupled components there. Uh, and when you start talking about efficiency and how do we run uh, with the smallest footprint while we're serving models, the, you're starting to get into exports that are targeting the exact type of GPU. So you've got an export that may run on an A100, but it will not run on an H100. Uh, that's, that's even more tight coupling. Um, and then we have things like this where we, we want to be able to say, here, kick off, a, kick off a hyperparameter sweep, and we want to make sure that nothing outside of that experiment changes except for the things I said to change. That includes the infrastructure itself. You can't just schedule you know, the second half of that sweep wherever you want. Um, so lots of tight coupling. No clear answers here beyond we try to solve each problem as we see it, but I, I, I do think it's a common, a common issue. Um, and that leads us into the topic of deployments. Uh, so, we, so we talked here about a lot of tight coupling, particularly on the exports area. Um, we have our SaaS system, and that's where we've optimized for the, the most efficient serving. Um, and if you're evaling a large model, you want to make sure that you can do that with the most efficient deployment of that, because uh, then we can use the least number of GPUs and it'll run faster. But um, this, is, this is most relevant to us, or where we saw this problem the most was in our post-training processes, that part of the life cycle, kind of the middle step. This is where they were running the most number of evals. They had the most number of uh, simultaneous jobs that they, were, they, they needed to look at um, compared to pre-training where it was you know, lower volume and a smaller number of people, so it was easier to deal with. So rubber meets the road here. We have a complex deployments process that relies on um, a lot of different teams. And we found the biggest challenge here was just tooling. We just need to have some really good, really simple tooling uh, as we scale up and start supporting these, these uh, post-training teams instead of just supporting a, a pre-training team. Um, it's complicated, so I'm gonna focus very specifically on, on this deployment flow because I think it's one of the most complicated ones that we've got. It involves seven different teams with seven different uh, code bases, all of which are tightly coupled together, and changes in one need to be reflected down the line. So you have uh, a process where you have to get the GPU, that's controlled by one team. You have to copy the weights between clouds, that's another team. You have to unshard those weights, that's a third team that manages that. Um, export it, fourth team, deploy it, a fifth team, and then actually do the thing you were trying to do, eval, uh, which is yet another team. Uh, this, was, this was a challenge, to be honest. It was something that we had a vision early on that we wanted to do, and we wanted to do it multi-cloud. So uh, it, was, it was kind of a, a long time in coming, but, but I'm happy to say we've, we've been able to, to get there. Uh, we've been able to punch past some of these, some of these problems, right, with the, the cross-cloud data sync the hardware coupling, the different teams, um, and we were able to get to a really cool solution that we, we call the deployer. Again, I'm not gonna go deep on this, but uh, these two pieces of technology, so using Hera uh, and Argo workflows, uh, to be able to make Argo workflows, which would work across our estate in all of our clusters, uh, to have that work well, um, and so be something that the, the MLEs could evolve, because again, six different teams. We couldn't just have one team that knew how to do this. Um, this worked, this has worked surprisingly well. It supports all multi-cluster fig. It works, uh, it, and it works really well with Python. Like I've been, I've been pretty impressed. Um, so this bit, we, we solved this, we released this, and now we have a deployment flow that's uh, been simplified enough that multiple people, multiple teams can evolve it and, and we can kind of keep going. Um, with how we, how we deploy and how we, we use our GPUs um, and improve the, the tooling experience for our post-training teams. Um, so just to recap, we've kind of hit most of the teams actually in our life cycle, but I want to take a big step back here and just remind everybody we had pre-training where we hit a lot of our big jobs and our GPU failures and we had to solve those problems. We have post-training, which you know, we just talked about with the deployment. Um, and then we have customer serving, which has its own like ups and downs uh, on accessing capacity and that kind of thing. And so this is, 
at a high level, the life cycle, there's a bunch of tooling that goes around that to, to support that life cycle. But this isn't the only life cycle. Like this, this happens for a single set of weights, and then it happens again for when we need to do another set of weights, and then it happens again when we need to do another. And so we have this growing problem of lots of capacity, lots of different like simultaneous model life cycles ongoing, uh, and all of them need accelerators. So this takes us to our final challenge of accelerator acquisition. How do we manage allocation and utilization? This is the fundamental problem that every company uh, gets to. Uh, when you talk about this, there's two things to talk about. Slurm, uh, which was released in 2022. It's been around for two decades. And 60% it, you know, of the supercomputers out there use it. And then there's Q, which you're at CNCF. So probably are familiar with Q. I think there was a talk two, uh, two talks ago of just about Q and uh, how, that, how that functions. Um, challenges we've seen, MLEs love Slurm, and I don't blame them. Uh, it's, it's an integrated environment, kind of from, from your dev machine all the way to a supercomputer. It's really hard to say, hey, just come adopt this workflow that involves you learning about Kubernetes and Docker and you know, systemizing something that's maybe for you is just a single experiment you need to run. Like, that's a big ask. Uh, you know, for them, bash is king, right? It's just hard to, to ask them and it slows them down. Uh, I'm a huge believer that innovation is a function of how much you can do without thinking about it. And if we're asking them to think about this, they're not thinking about how to improve the model. Um, the interface is a de facto standard for them. Job arrays, we don't have the equivalent over here. So there's a lot of cool things to like um, and that feel very necessary uh, in, the, in the Slurm environment. But for us, we needed Q. Uh, it supports the multi-cloud setup we talked about. It allows for like, borrowing across workload types, which helps us you know, ramp up utilization. Um, and for us, where we have you know, customers that we're working on, we need to be able to support things like isolation within namespaces and have a, a good security. So just really briefly, this is our, you know, this is our setup. We've done a, a setup where we can have cluster queues. We can have cluster queues that go to different, different target environments. And you can even, because it's Kubernetes, you can run Slurm on top of it. There's been some great talks about how to run a converged cluster uh, like that. So turns out we can use Q, um, and we have been using it for several months very successfully uh, to, to manage our multi-cloud multi, multi -cloud GPU estate. So real quick, some issues we've seen. Uh, connecting reality to the Q math is, is a, a challenge. Um, maintaining a triage buffer, all, another challenge, uh, and, and one that we've had to address. Um, making sure that you can adjust quota, that's non-trivial, and frankly, something that the MLE teams need to be able to do. Um, so something I would like to, to see us improve. And the preemption is very easy to mess up if you do it wrong. All right, so in summary, these are the challenges. We've been able to use a lot of CNCF technology to address them. Uh, super impressed with that, and really excited to see where we, where we can keep growing as a community. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Uh, we have time for questions. So yeah, go ahead, take the mic. Oh, we have two. And again, uh, the next speaker, Aditya, if you can come forward so that we start the mic. Hey, great talk. Um, I have a question about cost management. You talked about multi-cluster scheduling using Admirality, but do you guys use anything for uh, scheduling uh, optimization within a single cluster? Do you, use, um, do you use any internal tooling or any CNCF projects uh, like Carpenter? Yeah, to, to optimize within a single cluster. Yeah. Uh, not, not explicitly. I mean, we have found challenges around things like bin packing, especially as we right. have like much, much uh, smaller uh, workloads, many smaller workloads. But uh, we found just kind of the, the native Kubernetes tooling has been sufficient so far to drive up utilization there. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. It should be on now. Should be on. Thank you. OK. <laughs> um, you were talking about initially when you went from this you know, training, serving this hard wall between them. Very mm -hmm. familiar looking thing in my world. Um, when you're moving to the, being able to share those resources between those two environments, essentially, tell me a little bit about model progression. How do you know and ready and is, is there, are there other, uh, you know, um, governing factors that says, okay, this model's trained, it's ready to now go into it? Anyway, 
think yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. We we found that uh, most of that's we, we have to do like a lot of metadata management around the checkpoints themselves. Uh, so it's not so much the compute layer where we say, oh, this is ready to to be thrown over the wall, but it's more just checkpoint metadata. That's where we've got a lot of custom internal tooling to say. Uh, this is what we've done with this set of checkpoints. These are the gates that they've passed. Uh, this, is, this is kind of the, the evaluation framework and like where it looks, looks like. And then doing some automation that, you know, frankly is still a work in progress for us, but to be able to, to automatically copy things back and forth and say, okay, like we want to retain these checkpoints and we don't want to retain these based on uh, what kind of evaluation gates they've passed. Um, Got it. Just follow up then. Does that include like an in-house built model registry that you guys have done, or? Yeah, we have. We, we certainly use some external external tooling from a model registry perspective. I, I think you could probably claim like a lot of the in-house things that we've built are, you know, the spiritual equivalents of of a model registry. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So I, I have one question then. Uh, you, you talk a lot about multi-clouds and talk about queue. Have you played with the new functionality like multi-queue? And is there a functionality regarding topology or data locality that that is missing or that you would like? Yeah, for for queue, we because we were using it before the the uh, multi-queue functionality was available. We we actually did kind of our own thing. Um, but I think we're going to move towards that, so we're excited to look for that and some of the like multi-cohort, uh, like hierarchical cohorts. That's we're looking forward to that. Uh, in terms of data locality, uh, and then and then system to like network topology, um, those are things that the the data locality we've actually been able to mostly move data to where our our capacity is, um, and that's worked well for us to date. Uh, I do I do expect in the future that's going to shift where we need to go the other direction and uh, schedule where the, the data is. But we're, that's where we use some of our custom internal tooling. I could see a scenario where like, maybe that's more connected with Q uh, and like choosing where to admit the workloads. So that would be really interesting. Um, but admittedly, I don't, I don't know what kind of, what I would propose there. <laughs> yeah, sounds great. So I think, that, let's thank again the speaker. Thank you thank very you. much. Yep.